In this video, I will define, contrast, and provide examples of endocrine, paracrine, autocrine, and juxtacrine signaling. Paracrine signaling is a type of intercellular signaling where the chemical message, the paracrine signal, secreted by the signaling cell, travels a short distance through diffusion to bind to receptors on the target cell. Neurotransmission is an example of paracrine signaling, where neurotransmitters are the paracrine intercellular signal that is released by the presynaptic neuron into the synaptic cleft. Neurotransmitters diffuse a short distance across the synaptic cleft and bind to receptors on the surface of the postsynaptic cell. These receptors can be ion channels that will open in response to the neurotransmitter, stimulating an electrical signal inside of the postsynaptic cell. Another example of a paracrine signal is a growth factor like epidermal growth factor. Epidermal growth factor is secreted by signaling cells within the epidermis and binds to receptors on nearby cells. So epidermal growth factor diffuses through the tissue in order to bind to receptors on nearby cells and then stimulate cell division, stimulate mitotic cell division of nearby cells in order to stimulate growth of the epidermal tissue. Endocrine signaling is a form of intercellular signaling where the chemical message is a hormone. Hormones are intercellular signals released by endocrine glands that travel in the blood. The bloodstream can carry a hormone a long distance from the signaling cell of the adrenal gland to the target cell whose function is being regulated by the hormone. One example of a water-soluble hormone is epinephrine. Epinephrine is secreted by the adrenal glands and will travel through the bloodstream all through the body. The adrenal glands produce epinephrine in response to stress in order to help the body respond to stress. Epinephrine will bind to receptors on the surface of cells and then those receptors can activate an intracellular signaling mechanism. One example of a cellular response to stress that's stimulated by epinephrine is the breakdown of glycogen. Glycogen is a carbohydrate, a polysaccharide, that functions as a storage form of carbohydrate. When epinephrine stimulates the breakdown of glycogen, glucose is produced and released into the blood, and then that glucose can be broken down by cells throughout the body in order to help them cope with the stressful situation. An example of a lipid-soluble hormone is testosterone. Testosterone is produced by cells inside of the male gonads. The male gonads, also known as the testes, contain these cells known as interstitial cells of Leydig that will produce testosterone. Then testosterone will travel through the bloodstream and bind to intracellular receptors within target cells. Because testosterone is lipid soluble, it's able to cross the plasma membrane and enter the cell in order to bind to an intracellular receptor. Then the intracellular receptor hormone complex functions as the intracellular signal that will regulate gene expression, turning on and off the transcription of different genes. And this will regulate the functions of the cell, 
for example, in skeletal muscle, gene transcription will lead to stimulation of muscle growth, leading to increased muscle mass. Neurohormones are hormones that are secreted by neurons. So neurohormones are similar to neurotransmitters, that they're secreted by neurons, but instead of being secreted into a synapse and traveling only a short distance by diffusion, neurohormones are secreted into the bloodstream and can travel a long distance to reach target cells. Neurohormones are water-soluble hormones that are made from amino acids, and most of the neurohormones are polypeptides. One example of a neurohormone is oxytocin. So oxytocin is produced by neurons in the hypothalamus that secrete oxytocin from the posterior pituitary. And then oxytocin travels through the bloodstream to reach target cells in the uterus. In the smooth muscle of the uterus, oxytocin will stimulate contraction. Autocrine signaling is a type of intercellular signaling very similar to paracrine signaling. However, in autocrine signaling, the target cell is also the signaling cell. For example, when a signaling cell in the epidermis releases epidermal growth factor, epidermal growth factor can bind to epidermal growth factor receptors on the same cell that secreted the epidermal growth factor, and this can stimulate the cell division of the signaling cell. Juxtacrine signaling is a type of intercellular signaling that requires direct contact between two signaling cells. So the two cells are directly adjacent. One form of juxtacrine signaling is gap junctions that can allow a chemical signal to travel from the cytosol of one signaling cell into the cytosol of the adjacent target cell. Another example of juxtacrine signaling is the interaction between adjacent cells at a desmosome where cell adhesion proteins known, in, known as cadherins bind two adjacent cells together. This signal then is relayed inside of the cell and activates an intracellular signaling mechanism that can regulate the cell cycle. These cell adhesion proteins can function in a form of contact inhibition to slow down the cell cycle when the tissue is crowded and there's a large number of cells that are contacting one another. This contact inhibition will slow down cell division. Another example of juxtacrine signaling is the communication between leukocytes of our immune system. When a leukocyte encounters a pathogen, one way of defending against that pathogen is phagocytosis, where the leukocyte will engulf the pathogen. So the leukocyte shown on the left in this illustration is a phagocytic leukocyte that has engulfed a pathogen and then as that pathogen is digested inside of the leukocyte, fragments from the pathogen can be packaged into MHC proteins that are proteins that function to display the antigens, the fragments from the pathogen, on the surface of the phagocytic leukocyte. Phagocytic leukocytes will display antigens to T lymphocytes, also known as T cells. And this form of communication is how the phagocytic leukocytes can communicate to the T lymphocytes what types of infection the body is exposed to 
so that the adaptive immune response can be coordinated to defend against that infection.